Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today um, for this evening's talk by local historian and um, English Heritage volunteer, Alan Winter. This, is part, this talk is part of a number of different talks um, and Zoom lectures that we're hosting as part of Marble Hill Revived. Uh, Marble Hill is being revived and it's a really exciting project that will see the house being open for five days a week, our landscape invested in, our sports facilities improved, um, a wonderful new cafe, and of course, lots of fantastic events like this. Um, so thank you for being part of that revival. Just a few housekeeping um, things. This will be recorded as we hope to pop it on to the Marble Hill YouTube channel for more people to enjoy. Um, and you will be on mute for the duration of the talk. But please, please do ask Alan lots of questions. And you can do that by going to the chat function at the very bottom of the screen. It looks like a little speech bubble. Um, I'm sure you're all total professionals now by this from this Zoom, Zoom madness that we've had to uh, be part of. But um, please note that if you do raise your hand, we can't, um, we can't fire to you. So please just do use that chat function. And I will try my very best to make sure that I pose those questions to Alan at the very end of the talk. Um, so, without further ado, I'd really like to invite um, you to, to welcome Alan. Um, we are so delighted to have him back. Um, Alan produced the most fantastic um, talk last year, and it was all around um, depictions of Marble Hill through postcards. Um, and, it, and it's on the Marble Hill YouTube channel, so you can still enjoy it today. Um, but when I asked him this year, mind doing um doing a talk alan he said well i'm going to set myself a challenge um or indeed set us all a challenge and that was that uh, in the 300 years that marble hill has been around he believes that there are more celebrities and perhaps a little more beer uh, locally than in well, within a quarter of a mile of marble hill than in the whole of los angeles so I'm going to leave you to make that decision as to whether he's managed to prove uh, this, this hypothesis right. Um, so without further, further ado, I'd love to welcome Alan and thank you so much for being our speaker tonight. Thank you, Rachel. And what an intro. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for joining me tonight on a walk that's going to take us within about a quarter of a mile of Marble Hill Park. During the walk, we're going to visit four pubs. The four pubs are the closest to the park. And we're going to be on a celebrity hunt. We're going to be looking for celebrities who may be having a pint inside. Now, I grew up in Orleans Road in the 1950s and the early 60s um, on the west side of the park. And Marble Hill was effectively my back garden. I once said to a friend that the area had more celebrities working, playing and living in the area as I was growing up than Los Angeles, including the whole of Hollywood. Naturally, I was then asked to prove it. Well, tonight we'll see what we can do. So here we are. You can be the judges. Now, most of the images are postcards. Uh, there are a few extra photographs. And we're going to be covering, as Rachel said, some 300 years or so on our celebrity hunt. So I'm going to start tonight with the three pubs that we can't go into. We can't go into them because they're no longer there. But um, the, these pubs were each there for over 100 years, um, up until the beginning of the 20th century when they were forced to close. So we had two in Orleans Road. We had the Orleans Arms at numbers nine to 11, the Phoenix Inn, and uh, there on the left, you can see a picture of the Phoenix Inn, a, an old postcard. That was uh, midway down the road, numbers 28 and 30. And one you may not have heard of at all, the White Horse Inn. The White Horse Inn uh, was on the corner of Sandicombe Road and Richmond Road. Um, now, all three pubs shut down, as I said, at the beginning of the 20th century. They ran out of punters. All the men were called away. They were on war duty. Uh, they were called up. And quite frankly, um, you know, with, with pubs being the, um, 
the, the, the habitat of, uh, of very much of the working man at the time, the working men weren't there anymore. They, they were all called up. So we can't go in these three tonight, but what we're gonna do now is pop into a pub that we can go in, Rachel. So let's start off with the rising sun. The rising sun is on the east end of, uh, of Marble Hill Park. Um, it was once named uh, also in, in the last 20 years as both the Marble Hill and the Alexander, but uh, thank goodness uh, the, the Rising Sun has, has been renamed or named uh, back with its original name by today's owners. So let's open the door and uh, pop into the Rising Sun and see if we can see anyone we recognize having a beer. But let's start with Cardew. Cardew the Cad Robinson. Uh, not born locally, but for much of his life, lived at the, the flats in the Grove at St Margaret's down by the roundabout on the Chertsey Road. Um, got a bit of info on him. Um, he appeared in, in both films and the music hall from 1938. He reinvented himself as Cardew the Cad, and uh, he became a cartoon strip character in Film Fun, which was a children's comic uh, of the 50s and 60s. He appeared in films from the late 1930s right through to the 80s, and also television, including appearances in both Hancock's Half Hour and Last of the Summer Wine. So, Cardew Robinson, our first celebrity of the day. Let's find the second one. So we're still in the rising sun, and here's a Kiwi. Here's uh, Michael Miles. Now, Michael Miles was an, an actor, a writer, a presenter, but he was best known for presenting the game show, Take Your Pick, which was very early, early uh, a very early television uh, game show on associated rediffusion from the mid fifties, right through to 1968. Um, Michael was a regular in the rising sun, uh, but also used the crown and the white swan on occasion. Um, but they weren't the only celebrities to use the rising sun. And uh, here's someone I got to know over the years, Leslie Crowder. Now, Leslie wasn't born in the area, but he did come as a young man and he attended the Thames Valley Grammar School in uh, Watergrave Road. He became a comedian, but actually he was best known for being a presenter of television programs. Um, as, as you can see on the screen, Billy Cotton band show, black and white minstrel show, um, but probably best known for, for most, most people of my age group um, as the presenter, the main presenter of Cracker Jack, which ran pretty much throughout the 1960s. Um, I've still got my Cracker Jack pencil, have you? I knew Leslie Crowder and I knew him because I was a paper boy in Cyril Duffel's newsagent, which is right opposite the Crown. And Leslie uh, and his family lived uh, opposite the, uh, the gate in the middle of Richmond Road. Uh, so I was his paper boy and sort of got to know him and we chatted. And uh, we frequently actually played tennis on the, uh, on the hard court in, uh, in Marble Hill. Uh, really nice chap. Had five children, you know. And uh, one of his daughters, Caroline, uh, married the, uh, the rock star Phil Linnett, the, uh, the lead singer in Thin Lizzy. And um, again, you know, uh, Leslie was a lovely guy and uh, a really interesting family. You know, they all got to do something. But let's, uh, let's move on. And uh, we're gonna leave the rising sun. And what we're gonna do now is leave it through the east gate of Richmond Road, wander through Marble Hill, circumnavigate the house, come out of the middle gate on the River Thames where the steps are and where the black walnut tree is. We'll turn right, we'll wander down to Hamilton's Ferry, we'll jump on the ferry and we're gonna to cross to the Surrey Bank where we'll walk up to Richmond Hill and we're gonna have a look at the folks who live on the hill because they tended to be of a celebrity nature and from their back garden, they could all look directly down into Marble Hill Park, of course. So more celebrities uh, for the park. And the first two we've got here is uh, John Mills, an actor who appeared in more than 120 films over seven decades, quite incredible. 
starting with a film called The Midship Maid in 1932, and he rose to stardom later on with the lead role in We Dive at Dawn, which was a submarine-based uh, epic in the uh, 1940s. In 1966, he popped up in the, sorry, 96, he was still acting and he popped up in the comedy classic Mr. Bean with Rowan Atkinson, of all people. Um, he uh, was awarded the CBE in 1960 and um, John Mills was knighted in 1976. Now, Haley Mills on the right of your screen, the postcard on the right, was, was uh, John's daughter. And um, she was obviously a child actress. She made her debut at the age of 12 years old uh, in Tiger Bay, 1959. And she co-starred with her dad, uh, John. She did several Walt Disney films in the 60s, and she moved into TV in the early 80s with the series, The Flame Trees of Thika. Haley made her last film in 2011. Now, um, John and Haley lived in the Wick at the top of Richmond Hill. It's a, it's a huge pile and uh, very well known. Uh, it's had nothing but celebrities living there in recent decades. So if we can move on to the next slide, we'll see who he sold it to. So here we go, Ronnie Wood. Ronnie is still with us, of course, and um, gladly. And he bought the wick from John, John Mills in 1971. Uh, Ronnie is best known for what he's done in the last 40 years as a member of the Rolling Stones. But before that, he was a very young guitarist on Eel Pie Island with the Birds. Um, his brother was Art, uh, who, who uh, fronted the Artwoods. Uh, Ronnie also played guitar in the creation. Then he joined the Jeff Beck group with uh, Rod Stewart in the 60s and Ronnie Lane. Um, they both moved on to the faces and then he became a Rolling Stone. A lot of people think he should always have been a Rolling Stone. An artist as well as a musician, this particular postcard was painted by Ronnie and uh, went for an, the original went for an awful lot of money. I, I can't remember how much, but uh, he's a wonderful artist, wonderful musician and a lot of fun. But in 1996, he sold the wick to another local, and here he is, well known in these parts. Pete Townsend, born in Chiswick, formed The Who in, back in 1964. That's almost 60 years ago now. Pete actually lived in several houses in Twickenham before he bought Chapel House in Montpelier Row in 1985. Um, in 1996, he moved to the wick, uh, buying it from Ronnie, and uh, of course, overlooking Marble Hill. And um, you can't talk about The Who and The Rolling Stones without mentioning Sir Michael Philip Jagger, can you really? Because uh, Mick obviously didn't want to be lonely, so he bought Down House on Richmond Hill, uh, which is opposite The Wick. And in the early 90s, he moved in with his then wife, model Jerry Hall. Uh, Down House also has views across the Thames to Marble Hill. And Mick, of course, was probably one of the most popular and influential frontmen in the history of rock and roll. Found the member and lead singer of the Stones, knighted in 2003, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1989. Um, with the Stones, is written and performed 13 singles in the USA and the UK that all reached number one in their respective pop charts. Um, and he's just about to start a new tour in America with the Stones. Wow. Still performing at nearly 80. What more can you say? Mick, I salute you. Let's move on, Rachel. Now then, that rock royal, the members of the rock royalty we've just looked at, looking down over the years, uh, could all see Marble Hill House. And the house itself was built in the 19, sorry, no, it wasn't, in the 1720s for Henrietta Howard, who was best known as the mistress of King George II. So there's a celebrity for you straight away, a royal celebrity. Now, among her many friends were lots more celebrities and correspondents, including Alexander Pope, Jonathan Swift, and Horace Walpole. And if we can move on around the corner, there was even more royalty, because just up the road to the east, no, to the west, of Marble Hill House, it was Orleans House. 
And this is quite a wonderful etching um, from uh, something like 1870, I, I would suggest. And um, it shows Orleans House as it was, the building to the right of the octagon room. And while we're on the octagon room, here's an anecdote. Astrid and I got married in the octagon room in 2003. How about that for an anecdote? And here's another one while we're on this slide. If you look at the five people in the background, there is a rather short woman in the group of five people. Well done, Rachel. Well, that's Queen Victoria. And she was there to visit uh, King Louis Philippe of France, who lived in Orleans House for a number of years. Now, not only did the French monarchy and aristocracy live in Orleans House, they also lived in York House, Riverside House, and Highshot House over a period of 105 years. Now, I'm not going any further on that. They're royal, they're celebs, and that's what this talk's all about. If I spoke about this slide and the, and the, French, um, the French element of, uh, of who lived around Marble Hill, uh, the royals, we'd be here all night. So. We'll do that in another talk another day, maybe. High Shot House, by the way, was opposite the Crown on the left hand side of Crown Road, and it eventually became a home for inebriates. And I think that's another story for another day. So they weren't the only royals within a quarter of a mile of, um, of Marble Hill, because Prince Charles actually opened the New Orleans House Gallery back in 1981. When he came to town um, to celebrate Twickenham's 900th anniversary celebrations. And um, as such, he also opened Orleans Gallery uh, in, in 1981. Now, uh, to get out of, the, of um, Orleans Gallery these days, of course, you have to drive back up Orleans Road. And when you do that, you come to our second pub of the evening, which is, of course, the Crown. And here it is in 1906. Now it looks busy, doesn't it? It's actually a fascinating postcard. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the pub name, the Crown, is on the left-hand side of the road in front of pretty much nothing at all. Uh, and that's where the Masonettes are now on the corner. Um, I love this postcard because right in the middle of the Parade of Shops, which is still there, Crown Parade, is uh, the very news agents uh, that I told you I was a paper boy at and where I first met Leslie Crowder. Um, if you look down the, down the road to the east, you'll see a tram. If you look at the forefront, you'll see the tram lines in the road. They were only laid down in 1904. And so here we are two years later, all we've got in the road is a tram chasing a bicycle. Doesn't look like that now, folks, does it? And have a look at the policeman on the left by the lampposts. He's been replaced by a mini roundabout. Bring back policemen, that's what I say. Anyway, let's have a look and see who's inside the pub, shall we, Rachel? Ah, this is probably one of, um, my research tells me, is probably one of the oldest locals to use the crown. And of course, it's J.M.W. Turner. Joseph Mallord William Turner, who lived in Sandycombe Road, and designed uh, and built his house for his father. Um, he's got a blue plaque, of course. He didn't live there too long, uh, Dad did, but what we do know is that uh, research tells us that uh, J.M.W. Turner actually stabled his horse at the Crown. Now, I can't believe you're gonna stable your horse at a pub without going in to have a pint. So I think I'm justified in saying that he was one of the earliest local regulars to go in the crown back in the early 1800s. You can argue with me if you like, but you can't prove it either. And the next slide, Rachel. But the people who were there, and we know were there, um, are under the heading of celebrities. Um, I, I love this postcard uh, because I love Cleo Lane and John Dankworth. Uh, as a kid in the 1950s, I'd be laying in bed at Two Orleans Road, which was the house that backed onto the, the Crown's bottling shed, uh, listening to the jazz club throughout the 1950s and, and early 60s. 
the Crown moved on and, and became even more famous for music as we moved into the 60s. And uh, Rachel's going to show us who else was there. Because the large room at the back of the pub, uh, variously, it's been a snooker hall, a restaurant. But for the most part in the 50s and 60s, it was a jazz, folk and blues venue. And uh, hosted the likes of Tubby Hayes, Dick Morrissey, and later on in the 60s, moved, moved over to the blues when the blues scene opened. And uh, there were members of the Dynaflow Blues Band who, uh, who very kindly uh, brought some of the acts in. This particular um, shot is not a folk, uh, sorry, it's not a postcard. It's a shot of the Groundhogs, wonderful blues band who only recently stopped playing. And on the right there is one of my blues heroes, uh, Tony McPhee who was the uh, lead guitar and leader of the Groundhogs. But there was an even bigger band, wasn't there, Rachel? And here they are. Free appeared at the Crown twice in the late 60s. Now, if you don't know too much about the band, you've certainly heard this song, All Right Now, was released in 1970. Oh, it, it was a number one hit in over 20 countries uh, around the world. Not here, actually. It only got to number two. Um, they played the pub um, just before signing for Island Records when, when they only just uh, formed. Uh, All Right Now was their second single, and it reached number two in the UK top 10 in 1970, and number four in America in the Billboard chart. It was re-released in 1973 and reached number 15, re-released in 1991 and went back to number eight. Um, it has been played over three million times on US radio stations alone. How about that, you statisticians? That was a good one, wasn't it? Um, and it was written by uh, uh, Paul, Paul Rogers and Andy Fraser, the two guys on the left of the LP cover. Um, bit of an anecdote here. Um, after Free disbanded, Paul Rogers and Simon Kirk, who was the drummer, um, they formed the hard rock group Bad Company with Mick Ralphs and Boz Burrell. And uh, as Bad Company, they sold 40 million albums worldwide. So I would probably say that these four musicians uh, are probably the most successful musicians ever to have played at the Crown. Uh, but of course, we didn't know where they were going uh, when we saw them, probably only 20 people in front of the stage in that back room. Back in the, back in the late-ish 60s, we both worked together uh, for a year or so at Ellis's Wine Merchants in Water Lane in Richmond. We were on the Sherry Assembly Line, believe it or not. And what happened there Every day, like, giant low loaders used to turn up in that little street um, by, by Water Lane, in Water Lane, and unload huge barrels of Ember Cream Sherry. Well, what Ellis's did was bottle it and sell it in their various off licenses uh, and such like. And Simon and I were on that assembly line uh, bottling it. Um, I was on labels and he was on corks. <laughs> um, but um, he now lives in New York, and just before the pandemic uh, was the, the drummer with the Ringo Starr All-Star Band. Now you're gonna say, or some of you are gonna say, what on earth does Ringo want with a drummer? Well, this is how it works. Ringo is now over 80. He's still out there performing with the band, but when he gets up to sing old Beatles numbers, like when I'm 64, uh, he has to stand. So he has to stand at the front of the stage because he can't get the energy and the puff to sing while he's sitting down on a drum stool. So he needs a drummer and who better than Simon, one of the world's, one of the world's legendary rock drummers. Um, so that's why Ringo needs a drummer now. And uh, you'll, you'll be hearing a bit more about Ringo later in the talk. So uh, Rachel, now we can go and see who else is in the pub. And here we are, wonderful Ronnie Lane. And uh, Ronnie features in this pub for several reasons. When, when we spoke about the wick earlier, uh, a little story here, when Ronnie Wood uh, bought the wick, he couldn't actually afford the cottage at the end of the garden to go with it. And so he was in the faces at the time with, uh, with this Ronnie, Ronnie Lane, 
And so Ronnie bought the cottage, Ronnie Lane. Um, Ronnie Wood be, bought the wick itself, the main building. And a few years later, uh, Ronnie Lane sold the cottage back to Ronnie Wood so that Ronnie Wood ended up owning everything. Um, Ronnie Lane was uh, a regular in the Crown, in the saloon bar, certainly, and, and the Turks Head pubs. Uh, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2012. But for many years, uh, he lived in East Twickenham by Richmond Bridge, uh, living in both Cambridge Road and Riverdale Road for, as I say, many years. A founder member of the Small Faces, then joined the Faces with Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood. Uh, he went back on the road with Ronnie Lane's Slim Chance, but very, very unfortunately and very, very sadly, he became uh, too ill to perform um, due to multiple sclerosis and uh, we lost him. Uh, we lost him far too early, I'm afraid. And so let's move on, Rachel, see who else is in the saloon bar. Can we move from music to humour? And the reason Tommy Cooper used to turn up in the saloon bar of the, uh, of the pub was that um, he filmed a lot of um, television at uh, Teddington Studios in, in the early mid 70s. And he knew the publicans in the crown, uh, Ronnie Ross, who had been something of an impresario and his wife, uh, Marie, who was a bluebell girl and uh, Tommy who, who lived in Chiswick uh, all, all of his life actually. Um, got, got to know them very well. So the Crown was a suitable stopping off point after work between his workplace in Teddington and his home in Chiswick. And um, some of you are prob probably going to say, Tommy Cooper, what did he do? Well, he was pretty famous for wearing that red fedora, but he was even more famous for, uh, for one-liners. He had a very strange way of uh, presenting. He used to uh, present his one-liners quite, um, quite slowly. And sometimes he'd go silent, a bit like me really. And then came the one-liner. Throughout our marriage, my wife has always stood by my side. She had to, we've only got one chair. Now, if this was a live audience, you'd all be in hysterics by now, but I don't know if you are or not, so I can't see you. So I'll try again. I'm on a whiskey diet. I've lost three days already. Just like that. Rachel, I think we better go to the next slide. And we'll find another comedian who used to go in the saloon bar of the Crown. And this time it's the Irish wonder kid himself, Dave Allen. Observational comedian, satirist, I call him the religious comedian because he couldn't go anywhere without slipping a couple of religious jokes in. He wasn't anti-religious, he just used it as a platform for, for his shows. And um, during the, um, probably the late seventies, uh, they frequented the saloon bar of the Crown quite a lot. And um, rumor had it, quite a strong rumour had it that he was trying to buy a property in Montpelier Row. It, uh, I don't believe that that ever actually happened and um, he, he sort of moved on. But uh, certainly in that period, uh, to have both Tommy Cooper and Dave Allen turning, turning one-liners in the uh, Saloon Bar of the Crown was a bit of fun. I can only remember one one-liner from Dave, Dave Allen. Um, and he said that he was an atheist. Thank God. We move on. So now we leave the Crown, we walk up Crown Road, and we walk up Crown Road to the St Margaret's Hotel. Quick anecdote, I had my first stag night in there in 1969. Here's a tip for you. Never have a stag night the day before you get married at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Anyway, there's the St. Margaret's, beautifully located next to the station and next to the next slide, please, Rachel. Twickenham Film Studios. So here we are, we're having a talk about celebrities and we have piles of them over the decades uh, bundling in and out of Twickenham Film Studios, making adverts, shows, everything to do with, um, with, with, with the art of uh, filmmaking 
and uh, it was even used for, for TV and still is, as we probably know. I've just got to shuffle my paperwork. Bear with me, please. Because among all these stars who uh, filmed in Twickenham Fil Film Studios, there was one particular one, uh, Rachel, that we'll have a look at. And it was Gregory Peck. And he filmed uh, at Twickenham Studios to kill a mockingbird back in 1962. Um, a lot of the scenes were shot in Marble Hill, Marble Hill Park. And my mother, who's still alive at 97, bless her, tells me a story that one day she was taking the dog for the walk, for a walk in Marble Hill, sat on the park bench next to a chap reading the paper. Uh, he turned around and said, good morning to her. And it was Gregory Peck. And um, they, they had a bit of a chat and uh, off he went. And mum carried on taking her dog Tina for a walk. But he wasn't the only one, because also in Marble Hill Park, uh, we, we can show you a nice still from a film a bit later. And this is uh, the film The Wild Geese, which was filmed in 1978, The Wild Geese. And just look who was starring in this one. Uh, Richard Burton, Kenneth Moore, Richard Harris, Hardy Kruger. And this is a still uh, from the film showing the coach house in Marble Hill uh, for that film, The, the Wild Geese. Um, so with the St. Margaret's Hotel being next to Twickenham Film Studios, there were all sorts of celebs popping in and out of the pub, left, right and centre. Uh, and, and let's have a look and see who they were, Rachel. So here we are, we're in 1987, it's February. Um, the landlord and landlady of the, um, the landlord and landlady of the pub, uh, Jim and Elsie Roberts, invited members of the dart team, myself included, uh, to pop in one afternoon. Well, we thought that's a bit strange because pubs never opened in the afternoon. They closed at 2.30 and they shut up and they opened again at 5.30. But we went in in the afternoon and uh, there was Eamon Andrews. And the whole idea was that as a presenter, he, he presented This Is Your Life. He'd been an amateur boxer, a radio presenter, a crackerjack presenter but he spent uh, many years of his career uh, doing This Is Your Life and catching celebrities uh, and going through their life story. And he was uh, in the St. Margaret's Hotel to catch a celebrity. So there we were in February, 1987. Let's have a look and see who the celebrity was, Rachel. It was Norman Wisdom and it was his birthday. So on the 4th of February, 1987, Eamon Andrews jumped out from behind a pillar pounced on Norman in the saloon bar of the St. Margaret's Hotel. Norman's second appearance, actually, his first being in 1957, and it was his birthday. Who else have we seen in the St. Margaret's? Uh, Trevor, Trevor was a local. Trevor lived in St. Margaret's Road, um, opposite the Avenue, and he starred in, in one of the greatest uh, British sitcoms for many years, Are You Being Served? Uh, the programme spanned 69 episodes between 1972 and 1985. It had five Christmas specials uh, and also a film in 1977. It's still repeated regularly on, uh, all over the world. It, it, was, it was such fun and people would stay in and, uh, and watch it every Thursday night, I think it was. But dear Trevor Bannister, we've lost him now, but uh, a very, very nice man and a regular in the St. Margaret's Hotel. And then, one night in the St. Margaret's, let's see who walked in. Well, David Hemmings and his wife at the time, Gail Honeycutt, walked in. Um, this was quite interesting. There were only about four or five of us in the public bar playing darts, just practicing darts. And then these two guys walked in, took one look at us and walked round to the lounge bar. They obviously didn't like what they saw. <laughs> so uh, that they were round in the lounge bar and uh, David Hemmings um, starred in the 1966 cult movie, Blow Up. Uh, he was a child actor. He first appeared in films in 1954, carried on working right through to 2003, when unfortunately he died on set for a heart attack on a film being made in Romania. Um, Gail Honeycutt. Uh, American model uh, initially turned actress, uh, married uh, David Hemmings. In fact, she was one of his four wives. He had four wives. 
Um, Gail Hunnick had appeared in 30 films from the 60s onwards, and she also appeared in the popular TV programme Dallas in the 80s and early 90s. And then that night, into the public file walked Richard Harris. Now, come on. Now we're getting into big actors. This guy's, uh, th this guy's acting career, you could, you could write a book about. Many people have tried. What a wonderful actor. But, uh, you know, briefly, This Sporting Life, Camelot, Gladiator, Wild Geese, and even Professor Dumbledore in the first two Harry Potter films. So, why did this guy sing about making a cake that someone left out in the rain? Well, I'll try and tell you. In 1968, Richard recorded the, this song, and believe it or not, it reached number two in America. It was something of a novelty ballad. Uh, reached number two in America, number four in the UK. But when you analyze the lyrics, this is really, if any of you out there want to write pop songs, these are the sort of lines you have to write. Someone left the cake out in the rain. I don't think that I can take it because it took so long to bake it. And I'll never have that recipe again. Oh no. So if you can write that sort of rubbish, you can get in the top 10. So um, Richard sat on a bar stool and he was obviously waiting for someone and we were playing darts. We we're now in the public bar of the St. Margaret's and the door opened yet again. And who walked in this time, Rachel? Well, here he comes again. He's, uh, we've already touched on Ringo, but you, you can't keep a good man down. And um, not just Ringo, but the Beatles spent an awful lot of time in the local area right through the 60s until they split up in 1970. So there we've got John and Ringo in uh, Southwestern Road um, during the filming of A Hard Day's Night in 1964. I always get this wrong. It was either Help or A Hard Day's Night that came first. And um, also, of course, as the, uh, the, the business uh, ticket says in the middle, uh, they appeared frequently in Teddington on Thank Your Lucky Stars most Saturday nights. Um, so Ringo's walked in. Um, we've got Richard Harris already there. They put their names on the dartboard and waited to take their turn to play darts against the four or five of us that were in there. And there we were playing darts with Richard Harris and Ringo for the rest of the night. Well, how do you beat that? Well, I, I suppose you can't. So let's move on, Rachel. And we move on to the Turks Head. Opened in the, in, in the mid 1800s, rebuilt in 1902. These two postcards, 1905, 1907. So that's the outside, but let's walk through the door and see who we can find. And one of the first people that uh, you would always see in the Turks Head for a number of years, was Dennis Waterman. And of course, he became one of the, uh, the most famous television people of all time because he appeared in both of the biggies in the 70s, 80s and 90s with John Thor in the Sweeney and George Cole in Mindo. Dennis lived locally at the time and uh, was, was often in the soaps head. Good footballer as well, played against him once. Uh, Rachel, who else was there? Warren Clark, Mancunian, uh, first role in 66, the Coronation Street actor. He was in A Clockwork Orange. And he finished up uh, with Dalziel and uh, Pasco and uh, another chap I think we lost too early in, back in 2014. That's just a matchbox I found. Uh, a a match, matchbox was a, a bit of a giveaway in the Turks Head. Uh, Chris Brazier's Eating and Drinking in, Emporium. Well, Chris was the landlord, best part of 20 years, and uh, we all knew him if we lived locally for lots of different reasons. But let's move on. Who else was in the Turk Ted? Well, here he is again. <laughs> this time, 10th of March, 1964, Ringo Starr, and, he, and this time he's filming, he's working. He's filming A Hard Day's Night in the Turk's Head. Uh, that picture's still on the wall outside the gents, by the way, if any of you want to pop down and see it. Um, an anecdote to the, the Turk's Head, which is our final pub tonight, is that, of course, it's next door to a school. Well, it was a school I went to, uh, St. Stephen's School. And um, 
we never we never had anywhere to eat our school dinners at school so we used to use the Winchester room and um, back in mind there you might remember that they named their local drinking club the Winchester club and that was because Dennis suggested it um, that it was named after the Winchester room in the Turks head how about that um, so the, Be the Beatles, as we've already said, were all, all over St. Margaret's and East Twickenham for the best part of their career. Uh, virtually every year they, they were there. And um, Ringo, of course, was a dart player. So back in 64, he has this scene throwing a dart in the public bar. He nearly killed the pub parrot uh, that was on a bar in a cage uh, with his dart. And in the film, he, he then gets thrown out, ejected from the pub but almost killing the pub's parrot. He didn't really, he was quite a good dart player from, uh, from memory. And then uh, the year later, they were back in town yet again, back in Ailsa Avenue. And there's the four Beatles uh, filling, filming um, uh, the film Help. So let, let's leave the Beatles alone for a while and keep going. Oh, we can't because there, there they are. Still in 1964, there's a still from Twickenham Studios um, I did say that unlike the Who and the Stones, they had a relatively short career. And uh, the, the uh, shot on the right uh, is them uh, uh, taken at the Maddingley Club in Will Willoughby Road, uh, East Twickenham, still within a quarter of a mile of Marble Hill. And it was one of their last photo shoots in 69. So I think what we've got to do now is leave the pubs and we're going to go into Montpelier Row. Montpelier Row is the road immediately on the west of Marble Hill Park. And if you go right down the bottom, you come to South End House. Now, South End House has got a blue plaque on it. Walter Delamere lived there for some 16 years from the 40s through to the 50s. Who, who's he, you ask? Well, Walter Delamere was a novelist and poet, uh, probably best known for his children's work. And he lived in a flat. Um, in a very large, in the very large South End house uh, for all that time. His, uh, his ashes are, are buried in St Paul's. Um, I used to cut the grass in South End house uh, every, every Friday night. It was a, an extra few quid to earn. And uh, the owner was uh, a gentleman called Mr Sedgwick, who was a, a, a lovely man. He was the founder member of Bottles, which is the borough of Twickenham Local History Society. And he was a lovely chap and uh, I, I would go and cut the grass for him every Friday night. He had um, a guy living with him, a, a charming Chinese gentleman, who would always give me a bunch of flowers to take home to my wife, to my then wife. Uh, coming, coming away from South End House, which uh, overlooks Marble Hill, uh, we get down to number 15, Marble Hill Park, and here we find Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, living at number 15, which is the big house on the corner of Chapel Road. Now, uh, Alfred only lived here for a couple of years, and yet he's still got a blue plaque. Uh, yes, he was Poet Laureate. Uh, he was made Poet Laureate in 1850 and remained so for much of Queen Victoria's reign. What I find very interesting is that Chapel House, as I've always known it, and possibly is still called now, has actually uh, had three names in its lifetime. Uh, it's also been named uh, Holyrood House and Tennyson House. Uh, I'm not actually sure what it is today, but uh, I, uh, I, I think it should be Chapel House. You, you shouldn't change house names. You shouldn't change pub names, in my humble opinion. So let's carry on further down the road. And we come, no, we don't carry on further down the road. Uh, 140 odd years after Lord Tennyson moved out, Pete moved in. So uh, he lived here uh, between 1985 and 1996. Uh, and I'm hoping very much that uh, one day there will be two blue plaques on the wall of 15 Montpellier Road. And we can, walk, we can uh, wander down the road a bit further, I think, Rachel, and we can find the house of Archibald Sinclair. Now, I, I'm pretty certain some of you are going to say, Archibald who? Well, this guy was the Secretary of State for Scotland in the 1930s. He was the Liberal leader for 10 years, from 1935 until the end of the war. He was Secretary of State uh, in Churchill's coalition government during the war. 
and um, he both lived and died in Montpelier Row. He, he died following a stroke in 1970. My dad knew him. My dad was a builder. He had a builder's yard in Orleans Road and was often working in uh, Archibald's house. I, I, I was too young. I, I was a kid then and didn't really get to know him. But my dad said that uh, quite frequently Winston Churchill would call on him um, in the 60s and the 70s. They, they were great buddies. And I'm quite intrigued, as you may be, with the postcard on the right. Um, obviously, it's Winston. And um, uh, the, uh, the title is the Prime Minister faces facts and gives facts. Well, I think that's quite a good slogan for a Prime Minister. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if Boris thinks so. We'll see, I'll leave that one alone, shall I? And we'll carry, we'll carry on down Church Road till we get to number 12, Rachel. And here we have probably at the time, along with David Bailey, one of the most famous photographers in the world. Uh, Norman Parkinson uh, lived at Londy's house at number 12. Um, he was the photographer of celebrity. He took photographs of royalty, uh, pop groups, models, wherever there was celebrity, there was Norman Parkinson. In fact, he, he became a celebrity himself and a big one. Um, he had his, um, he was also uh, pounced on by Eamon Andrews for, for his um, um, uh, evening of, of This Is Your Life. And um, another little anecdote, my step-grandmother, Alice Winter, was actually his housekeeper for many, many, many years. So I do know a little bit about Norman Parkinson, and um, thankfully I, I do anyway. And um, the, the day that he was caught by Eamon Andrews, he was at lunch uh, with Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew was uh, in on the whole thing. And the idea was to get Norman to the Theatre Royal by four o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, Prince Andrew managed to, to get him there on time, despite being caught in a lot of traffic. And um, Alice Winter, my, my aunt, was, uh, was on the guest list and it was one of her proudest moments to walk onto the stage and uh, greet her employer, Norman Parkinson. Love the picture on the right, by the way. This is the back garden of 12 Montpelier, um, next to Marble Hill. Uh, it shows his wife, Wenda, uh, with, the, with the lawn mower, no, the lawn roller, uh, then his son, Simon, and then a friend called Sue Robertson, who apparently lived nearby. If you look in the bottom left-hand corner, this is Norman's cat. It was called Taxi. So there you go. Now, Norman had an idea. He knew all the celebrities in the world because most of them lived in London. Um, and um, he, he'd taken photographs of most of them. So he wanted to have a party. But he was in the middle of downsizing to a smaller, smaller premises than London's house. And he, he was in the process of moving near a York house. But he had a friend and his friend was Lorna Hausman and uh, Lorna lived at number six. They were chatting one day about uh, Norman's idea of having a, a celebrity party and she said well you can use my house and that's what happened and so one night if you looked out of your window in Montpelier Row you would have seen the psychedelic Rolls Royce, and that of course was John Lennon's Phantom Five. It was parked there all night because the Beatles were almost first to arrive in that Norman had been um, photographing them that day apparently. And so they'd more or less all turned up together. Um, the roller followed uh, Norman back to Lorna Houseman's house. So they were there first, but this is all about celebrities. So we're nearly finished. But who else was at this uh, legendary party? David Jacobs, um, 65 years a celebrity, radio and television presenter, Radio Luxembourg, Jukebox Jury. He was one of the first uh, anchor presenters on Top of the Pops. Uh, and, and he finished his years as a Radio 2 anchor man. And uh, he was followed through the front door of number six by Richard Attenborough. Well, who, who, who he? 
well, probably only one of the biggest actors in the world uh, at, at that time. One of the things you won't know about Richard, uh, or sorry, you may well know about Richard, is that he was a Chelsea supporter. Well, he was a bit more than that, actually, because he was also a director and vice president of Chelsea Football Club. David's brother, as you all know, also lived in Richmond, also knighted, also surprised by Eamon Andrews for This Is Your Life in 1962. Hugely successful acting career, and uh, Richard Attenborough won many, many awards in his long career. And who else was there, Rachel? Well, Mary Quant, remember her? Dame Barbara Mary Quant, British fashion designer. Um, she was there and at the time was probably the most well-known fashion designer in the world. She'd achieved worldwide fame, of course, as a designer of the miniskirt and hot pants uh, and, and one of Norman's regular photographic um, uh, people. He, he took lots of pictures of her. But you can't be a fashion designer without a model. So we need a model. And why not, why not have the best, the, the most famous model ever in the history of the world? Twiggy was at the party at number six. More than a model, uh, Twiggy uh, in her time was actually a wonderful actress and a very competent singer as well. Um, so she was also at the party. So I think that we're getting pretty near in summary uh, to the end of what I was hoping to do, which was to prove that this Marble Hill area, uh, right on our doorstep, uh, or some of our doorsteps, has hosted more celebrities over the years who played, worked, and lived in the area than Los Angeles, including Hollywood. That was the premise. Uh, we'll see. Um, what a party. It went on till six o'clock. Uh, in the morning when breakfast was served in a marquee in the afternoon. So here are some of the celebrities. And now here's some of the beer. There it is. <laughs> uh, and as for tonight, folks, that's all, as they say, in the trade. So cheers for that. Thank you for coming. Back to Rachel. Thank you so much, uh, Alan, for such a fantastic romp through a variety of celebrities um, uh, throughout the years, uh, three, spanning 300 years. It's quite yeah. impressive. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to say, I, I am totally blown over that there's definitely far more celebrities in a quarter of a mile of Marble Hill than there was in Los Angeles. Um, so uh, so Thank I, you. <laughs> I hope all of you um, are, are two. Um, uh, there's a, a couple of questions, but I do urge you, if you if you would like to ask Anne in any more detail, please do um, through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, just do that uh, little speech bubble, and we'll do our best to be able to um, pose those um, those questions. Um, so my first one is uh, about Pete Townsend um, and you know kind of there is some belief that he may well have been at that legendary party how do you know well there is a lot of belief a lot of people told me that he was there Rachel uh, but how do I know um, the horse's mouth that's well, the answer to that one <laughs> I'll leave it there but no Pete wasn't at that party he in fact he didn't move into Montpelier Row uh, for some 20 years after that party uh, took place. Fantastic. Well, uh, kind of the, that's that's a proper connection. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> um, but I've, I've got lots of thanks in the chat um, uh, for bringing back some wonderful memories um, and how exciting life was um, in those days, days ago. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, and lots of people saying a huge, huge thank you. Um, there's, there's just a question that's just come in saying, do we know if Queen Caroline uh, was ever in Orleans House at the same time as George II was in Marble Hill House, seeing Henrietta, husband and wife, just a few hundred yards apart, was so <laughs> socialising somewhat differently? Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think it's a wonderful question. Wonderful question. I really don't know. Um, no, wasn't there. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, you'd be looking very good for 300 years old. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Um, we do know that um, English heritage, we believe that um, they, they, the, uh, that never happened. So although that it is that, that uh, obviously um, both houses were inhabited by um, liaisons of King George II, and oh, we're going to carefully put this one, um, uh, they, they weren't there at the same time. So, um, so I'm sorry about that. Um, although that would have made a, um, a definite uh, headline paper if there were them at that time. Um, uh, there's lots of people saying that they didn't know that so many celebs lived so close. Um, and, and obviously that kind of we've got such uh, celebrated um, pubs around the area. Um, and someone does say that, um, gosh, Alan, I think that you might have spent a lot of time in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if that's a question, I, I, I would have to answer in the affirmative. <laughs> Um, yes, I have. <laughs> I think, well, clearly, because you were playing darts, Alan, that's, that's what it was. Of course. Only to play darts, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, someone asked about where on earth would people have parked when they were going to a, a party at Montpellier um, You know, kind of the psychedelic car was, uh, you know, a bit conspicuous for the Beatles, perhaps. Um, do you know any more? Um, well, not so much traffic on the road in those days and with those sort of celebrities. Um, in, in fact, um, every, I don't think I mentioned it, but the whole of Montpelier Road was invited. So they would have walked and um, the psychedelic roller um, followed Norman Parkinson all the way from the photo shoot. And um, the, the rest of the celebs, I would imagine, came by taxi. I, yeah, I'm surmising to a degree there. But um, the 1960s, um, you know, we had roads that we could park in all around the country. <laughs> Life has changed. This is true. Um, but this talk has even brought up someone who also had a paper round in Montpellier Road. So um, it's, it's wonderful that we've got so many local people um, uh, listening today. So thank you all for being here. I just wanted to finish this talk with um, a question about Obviously, your uh, Marble Hill was your playground, as you as you said, in your backyard. And so, um, I just wanted to ask, what what's your favourite memory of Marble Hill? Did you oh, see gosh. celebrities? <laughs> gosh, 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 yes. Well, it hasn't got a celebrity in it, um, but but my abiding memory of the park uh, goes back to when I was about nine or ten, nine years old probably. Um, I attended St Stephen's School. And as a third year in a, in a four year school, um, I was selected to play in the school football team. I didn't sleep the night before, you know. It didn't happen very often that you would play out of your age group and uh, someone must have noticed that I could kick a ball in a straight line occasionally. Um, I, I, I was so nervous, so nervous, playing football, representing the team, playing with the big boys in the, in the higher year. Um, but after five minutes, I headed a goal in. <laughs> and I can't tell you what the score was, I just don't remember, but I'll never ever forget heading the ball into the net in Marble Hill Park in the mud. Um, uh, as a nine, nine or possibly 10 year old then. And uh, every time I walk through Marble Hill, I point to that spot, whoever I'm with and say, one of my first competitive goals. <laughs> That's my memory. <laughs> well. A fantastic memory to uh, to finish off with and a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Alan, for, for pulling together such fan fabulous information about um, our celebrities in our local area. Um, it really has been a delight to have you with us this evening. And I, I echo a, a huge thanks that has been um, uh, put on the chat. Thank you so much, Alan, and have a lovely evening. And I hope you now get a chance to have one of those lovely beers. <laughs> Cheers, Rachel. Thanks so much. Cheers. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye. Goodbye.